Thank you so much. I see folks taking their seats. I know we have several folks online. Um, first, let me say an incredible welcome. Um, we're, we, I have sitting in front of me uh, the president of Iceland, who will be speaking to you very soon. We have a few introductions to make. First, I want to say hello. I'm Melody Brown Burkitz. I am the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth. I am a proud alumna of this uh, college. I did uh, my graduate degree here. I got my PhD way back when. Um, have been working in polar studies and governance for a very long time. And it is such a distinct honor to have uh, the president here today. And I also, a really distinct honor, you'll hear more about, we have uh, another alumna here, Ambassador de Mount is here, who was part of the instrumental, was instrumental in bringing Dartmouth and Iceland together um, back when he served as the US ambassador to Iceland. We also have uh, here the Provost Coates, who will introduce the president himself. And one of our longest and most cherished partners from Iceland, who you'll hear from in just a moment, is uh, Dr. Nils Einarsson, who is the director of the Stephenson Arctic Institute. So I'll say that quickly, but first let me just tell you the Institute of Arctic Studies, again, has been at Dartmouth, has a, a, lo a long, long history. It's had distinguished directors. It is my honor to be the director now. You, I can't go into all of the history, but there's this special connection between uh, the Arctic and, uh, and Dartmouth that is really grounded in a collection that we just w visited with uh, at the Rauner Special Collections, the Stephenson Arctic, it's the Stephenson Polar Collection. Uh, Wilhelmer Stephenson, who was here as a lecturer in the 1950s, he taught how to make snow caves and snow homes, or igloos as we called them, on the green to decades, so to many, many students. John Sloan Dickey, the president himself, thought that Wilhelmer Stephenson's time here was really what grounded Dartmouth in under, being a portal to the Arctic, knowledge about the Arctic, about its health, its security, and most uh, it, its environment, climate change, and most importantly, the relationship to the indigenous peoples of the North. And it's a long history. It's a complex history. It's one we are revisiting all of the time here at our institution, and, and it's just so such an honor to be here now having so many folks talk about not only Arctic and our role in it at Dartmouth, but all of the Arctic nations and the peoples of the Arctic and how they look at it as a bellwether for the future of our of how we engage with one another, how do we cooperate in the face of climate change and rising tensions of geopolitics? How do we these, how do we take these relationships that Dartmouth has had for decades and turn them into knowledge for our students, leadership for our next generations, and ways that we can work in the world in more peaceful, sustainable, inclusive, ethical, and thoughtful ways to bring the cooperation of the Arctic back to the center and the understanding of what Dartmouth can bring through convenings, through conversations. This is what the Institute of Arctic Studies is about. This is what the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding is about. And we, again, the resources we have, the faculty we have, the students we have at Dartmouth, and the, uh, the Stephenson Polar Collection here at Dartmouth, these make this come alive, and they give me hope for the future of the Arctic, for the future of climate, for the future of our engagement with peoples around the world. And you have a very wonderful time here to understand, uh, a, a day here to understand, hear this from the, the, from the actual leadership of an incredible Arctic nation. But first, let me introduce Dr. Nils Einarsson of the Stephenson Arctic Institute, who will tell you a little bit more about the Stephenson Memorial Lecture that this is, uh, that we have brought the president here to speak. Um, about Dr. Niels Einarsson is an anthropologist. He's uh, st worked with Dartmouth for decades. He is the director of the Stephenson Arctic Institute, as I mentioned. That Evelyn Stephenson Neff, Stephenson, uh, Wilhelmer Stephenson's widow, actually uh, recognized the power and importance of having Iceland, the Stephenson Arctic Institute, run by Niels. Um, come and work with Dartmouth at least once a year, and now it's becoming even more on joint partnerships to think about the future of the Arctic. So Nils has been an incredible partner to the Institute of Arctic Studies long before I was here. He worked with Ambassador Mount. He worked with the first Institute of Arctic Studies director, Orrin Young, and it's my honor to have him come up to the, to, to the podium and tell you a little bit more about the Stephenson Memorial Lecture we're, we're uh, about to have today.
So I've been here forever, as Melody says. <laughs> uh, President Jonasson, uh, honored guests, hello everyone. Uh, the Stevenson Memorial Lectures uh, or lecture is uh, more or less annual event of the Stevenson Arctic Institute of Iceland and the Institute of Arctic Studies at the Dartmouth College John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. The lectures are delivered in commemoration of the explorer and anthropologist Wilhelmur Stefansson of his life, work and vision for the Arctic. These lectures are generally held in the autumn uh, around the time of Stefansson's birthday, which is uh, November 3rd. Uh, he was born in Arnes, Manitoba in 1879 of Icelandic uh, parents who had emigrated from uh, Eyjafjörður, uh, North Iceland, three years earlier. And the lecture is supported, as uh, Melody said, by the Evelyn Stephenson Neff Endowment. Now, the first Stephenson Memorial Lecture uh, was delivered give, and, and given in Akureyri in Eyjafjörður uh, in 1999 by Professor Oran Young who was then director of the Institute of Arctic Studies uh, here at uh, Dartmouth College, uh, on the subject of creating an Arctic sustainable development strategy. Um, as always, Oran did a fantastic job being his usual intellectual beacon of informed insight and experience, and an outstanding scholar drawing a picture of the Arctic as a complex geopolitical world, but also the homeland of some four million people in need of nimble, nuanced, and culturally and historically sensitive governance pathways. Uh, Oran's emphasis was on the importance of respectful collaboration between research and Arctic inhabitants, indigenous and non-indigenous people and people, peoples, in the pursuit of creating knowledge that reflects local realities useful for designing um, uh, policy roadmaps for equitable and sustainable futures in the Arctic. This paradigm is also very much at the core of common values and goals shared by our two institutes, the Institute of Arctic Studies and the Staff Institute in Akureyri, um, and has been the base of our excellent and fruitful joint journey the past quarter of a century. Having the Institute of Arctic Studies in Dartmouth as our main international partner uh, has been crucial in our work in Akureyri, and this is something we will be celebrating with new projects and initiatives during the, during the Stephenson Arctic Institute's uh, anniversary, uh, 25th anniversary next year. Uh, and very special and warm thanks are due to the Institute of Arctic Studies directors, Orlan Young, Ross, Virginia, and uh, Melody Birkins. But since Oran set sail for the lecture series in 1998, we have had an outstanding and impressive uh, crew of individuals, researchers, policymakers, writers, and thinkers give the lecture. They have all made in important contributions to the Arctic for a better understanding and, and robust and informed policy to the benefit of Arctic inhabitants and environments. This will be the 20th or perhaps the 21st lecture in the series. Uh, I'm actually not quite sure, and I blame it on the Swedes, <laughs> as they provided two lecturers for the 2004 Stephen Memorial Lecture which was part of the program for the visit of the Swedish Royal Highnesses to Iceland that year. When both Foreign Minister Laila Freivalds and Professor of History Sverker Sölin gave excellent substantive talks. In any case, that year we got a two for one, which was a pretty good deal. Now the year before, in 2003, the lecture, lecture was delivered by the Governor General of Canada, Mrs. Adrian Clarkson, and 20 years ago, in 2002, it was the then, the then president of Iceland, Dr. Ólafur Ragnar Grímsson, who gave the lecture here at Dartmouth College, uh, speaking to the subject of the Stephenson Dartmouth legacy and the role of America, Russia, and Nordic countries in the future of the North. We do not have time to name all the people who have taken on the task of giving the lectures. I just want to mention that apart from President Johannesson, 
uh, whom we are all uh, waiting to see in the podium. Uh, we are also lucky to have with us two previous lecturers, namely Dr. Astrid Ogilvy and uh, Dr. Margaret Wilson, both fine scholars of international repute and very special friend of the Stephenson Arctic Institute. Thank you very much. And it is my honor now to welcome to the podium the Provost of Dartmouth College, David Coates. Thank you, Melody, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's uh, really my honor to be here to introduce the president, our guest, uh, for this um, honorable lecture series. Um, it's really also on behalf of the college a true honor for Dartmouth to host the president of Iceland, a distinguished scholar as well as one of the country's foremost political leaders. Dartmouth has always been proud of its motto, Vox Clementis in Deserto, a voice crying in the wilderness. It reminds us, though, even though we are a small institution tucked away in a quaint river valley in New England, our voice, our reach, and our influence, and our impact is truly global. It remind, the, the friendship and partnership we share with Iceland through this annual Stephenson Memorial Lecture is a cherished part of that global voice. It is a partnership that, as you heard, has developed an advanced high-level Arctic scholarship across the arts, the sciences, and the humanities. It has also engaged Arctic leaders around the world in forming Arctic policy on issues of governance, gender equality, ocean shipping, fisheries management, and ecosystem health for almost 25 years. I cannot mention this partnership without again acknowledging the vision of Ambassador Day Mount, class of 62, who is with us here, the, here today. And I also want to thank um, his wife, Kathy, for their lifelong commitment to Dartmouth. So thank you for, for being with us today, and thank you for your, for your support. <laughs> Ambassador Mount, your work with Dartmouth's Institute of Arctic Studies, first director, Dr. Oren Young, and with the Stephenson Arctic Institute director, Niels Einersen, long ago helped create this partnership, and that was ahead of its time. So I'm, I'm very proud to, to have you with us today. Uh, you helped establish one of Dartmouth's first, most valued, and longest standing Arctic partnerships. And now, over 24 years later, Dartmouth and the Ar Institute for Arctic Studies and the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding continues to build on that early vision. We engage scholars and government leaders of Iceland, as well as a diversity of academics, indigenous knowledge holders, community leaders, governments, and institutions throughout the circumpolar north. These connections, developed and maintained over decades, have ensured Dartmouth is recognized as a trusted convener and host for challenging dialogues on issues critical to Arctic nations and Arctic peoples. From climate and security to governance, gender equality, health, language preservation, and human rights, these conversations can safely develop here in Hanover, in Akureyri, and then move out to the world as informed policy recommendations and solutions. Today, as rising international tensions are on all of our minds, as we hope, we hope the Arctic continues to be a region of peace and sustainable development, we welcome these dialogues. In particular, we welcome hearing more about the role of Iceland in the Arctic. It is our sincere honor to have to Iceland's president, Dr. Goni Johannesnen, um, to here at Dartmouth today, personally reflecting upon the country's independence and interdependence nationalism, and globalization. President, president Jonasson is the sixth and current president of Iceland, but he's also a scholar as well as a political leader with multiple books and articles to his name. These include books containing his scholarship and analysis of the 1972 Cod Wars, the 2008 financial crisis as it impacted Iceland, and the history of Iceland's systems of governance. Prior to taking office as president in 2016, President Jonasson taught history at the University of Iceland, as well as at Reykjavik University. He earned his PhD in history at Queen Mary University of London in 2003, and previously studied at Oxford University, as well as at the University of Iceland. It is our distinct honor and pleasure to have President Jonasson here today on campus to continue the deep and historic partnership between Dartmouth and Iceland. So please join me in welcoming the President of Iceland, Goni Johannesson.
Dear Provost, Directors of the uh, Institute of Arctic Studies and the Wilhelm Stephenson Institute, dear students, everyone else, Kairu Landar, Gamana Shawekur Hetna, Kairu Islandingar. There are a few fellow Icelanders here in the audience, and I couldn't resist the temptation of greeting them specially. You will forgive me. After all, I'm going to talk about Iceland, and I'm going to talk about nationalism. So it goes without saying that I will say a special welcome to my fellow Icelanders. It's a tremendous honor to be here. It's a tremendous honor to be uh, given the opportunity to deliver the uh, memorial lecture in Wilhelm Stefansson's name. I'll go briefly uh, back to Wilhelm Stefansson, but I'm no expert on him. You will have to look to somebody else if you want to know more about Wilhelm Stefansson. But what I can talk about, and what I want to talk about, and I hope you will enjoy with me for about half an hour or so, and then we'll have questions, is this tiny, tiny little island in the North Atlantic, with its tiny little population. I know I'm head of state, I shouldn't talk like this. <laughs> but it's true, we're tiny, we're small, we're distant. But sometimes, you can turn your smallness into strength. Sometimes you turn your weaknesses into strength. And sometimes you punch above your weight. I don't recommend punching. But <laughs> if needed, then sometimes you have to do it. Like, for instance, during the court wars. I'll go back to the court wars also. <laughs> Our fishing disputes with the Brits, with the evil Brits. <laughs> <laughs> we can joke, but it's also a deadly serious matter. The combination between the two, nationalism and living in a globalized world, independence and interdependence. So come with me on a journey to this small island. It's not only small, it is one of the youngest islands on Earth. It's only about 16, 17 million years old. That's young in uh, geological terms. And uh, a factor reside, re rising from that is, uh, is our uh, abundance of geothermal energy. Iceland has volcanoes and hot springs and hot water underground, which enables us to heat our homes uh, through the use of geothermal resources and also generate electricity. And we have glaciers, receding glaciers, due to climate change. But still, an abundance of water in waterfalls, enabling us to uh, create or use hydropower. But also, when you look at a waterfall, what value does it have? Yes, you can harness it, create energy, build a factory, aluminium factory. Everybody benefits, yes? It's not so simple. A waterfall can also have value on its own in its majestic beauty, especially when we get foreigners to come to Iceland <laughs> and admire that waterfall. So all of you, you're all particularly welcome to Iceland <laughs> and to enjoy its nature in all its splendor. So it's a young island, 16, 17 million years old, yes. It is also a young society Iceland was one of the last, uh, last territories on Earth to be discovered by us human beings. Yes, some islands in the Pacific, almost certainly, uh, Madagascar, if I know my history correctly, but then Iceland, settled by humans for good in the, probably in the 8th, 9th centuries at the earliest. Yes, there may have been some people who strayed there before, but proper constant settlement began in those centuries. So it's also a very young society in that regard. And very few people live there. How many people live in Iceland? It's me, <laughs> mom, 372,000, and now I'm guessing 682 people by the last count. So it's very small by whatever measure you take. 
a very small island in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, it's also a young state. I'm not going to tire you with a long talk about how we moved from being settled in the 8th and 9th centuries to where we are today. But in the briefest of explanations, Iceland was settled, yes. And uh, there was a, what we can call a, a commonwealth in the first few centuries. Then uh, there was civil strife, civil war. Iceland uh, came under Norwegian rule and then Danish rule. We got home rule from Denmark in 1904, sovereignty in 1918, practically full independence, but we still had the king of Denmark as our sovereign. But then in 1944, uh, full independence. Iceland became a republic in the middle of the war. The Danes weren't too happy about it. It's a complex story, but basically we said we have the chance to become independent, and that's what we want to do. So goodbye. But it was a nice breakup. It was, there was no violence. And uh, I have said so and will continue saying so to my Danish friends and others. If you have to pick a sort of colonial master, I would go for Denmark. They were pretty nice to us. <laughs> so it wasn't a violent breakup in any sense. But you become a republic, and then you need, you need a president. If we hadn't taken that step, I wouldn't be here. Who should become president? Well, in the late 1930s, we in Iceland could see what might happen in the not too distant future. We are going to found our own republic. And who should become president? Well, there was a poll. And who came first? Yes, our good old Wilhelmur Stefansson. And now I'll tell you what I know about Wilhelmur Stefansson from not having before I sort of prepared for this lecture. Born of Icelandic parents in, uh, here in North America and became, through his uh, research and uh, voyages up in the cold north, up in the Arctic, uh, well known uh, internationally. And as we Icelanders uh, felt and realized, probably the best known Icelander, even though he was not born in Iceland, did not have Icelandic citizenship, we called him our own because he was of Icelandic ancestry. He spoke Icelandic. He, was, uh, he had strong ties to the old motherland. And why not make him president? It didn't turn out like that, but it shows our affection for him. And it shows also our need to be recognized. We chose another president, Svet Björsson, and I'm the sixth in line. But in 1944, when Iceland became a republic, the question immediately arose, can we do it? Can we survive there on our own? Yes, we're 372,000 or whatever I said, you know, at the last count now. But back then, 140,000 people or so. And those of you who know history and international relations quite well, there were not, not that many independent states in the world in the mid-1940s. Can Iceland survive on its own? That's a question that can maybe fill you with self-doubt, but it can also fill you with the spirit of, yes, we're going to show them we can do it. So as I move along later on to the question of nationalism and its positives and disadvantages, being independent can bring this advantage. I'm going to show them. That's the spirit that Icelanders felt in the mid-1940s. We're going to show ourselves and others that, yes, we can survive on our own. But it needed a few steps still. You got political independence in 1944, real independence. But we needed to gain full sovereignty over our natural resources. Iceland, a rock in the middle of the North Atlantic, fisheries was of primary importance for us, for our economy. In the 20th century, there was hardly anything else that provided us with uh, 
uh, with uh, foreign income, which generated uh, profit, exports. It was fisheries and nothing else, practically nothing else. Problem there, there were others interested in the fish of Iceland, primarily the British. Now I have nothing against the British, but we had to solve this issue. Uh, the, uh, there were a few issues or factors in our favor. The international law of the sea was flowing in our favor, in our direction. So the law of the sea earlier on said that you can have three mile limits of territorial waters, basically three miles from the coastline. That is the, that is the territory of the, national, of, the, of the coastal state. Everything else, freedom of the high seas. Everyone there can do what they want, fish as much as they want, because the sea is plentiful. There's always enough sea. That was the feeling back then. Gradually, however, Nations felt that this was unfair. You had to be able to extend the fishing limits and uh, encouraged by uh, international development. That's what we Icelanders did. We moved from three miles to four miles in 1952. 1958 from uh, four miles to 12 miles. 1972, 12 to 50. What on earth are they thinking up there, the Brits felt? And in 1975, from 50 to 200. <laughs> now, mind you, this was always more or less in connection with international developments. But the British side was not happy, to say the least. And on the last three occasions, they sent the Royal Navy, British warships, up to the disputed waters to protect their fishing vessels from harassment by the Icelandic gunboats. We do not have a navy, we Icelanders. But we had uh, these gunboats, yes, uh, Coast Guard vessels. And in the first conflict, in the late 1950s, everything, the only thing that the Icelandic Coast Guard could do was to yell at the uh, fishing <laughs> people of the British fishermen and say in strong Icelandic accent, you are fishing illegally in Icelandic waters, you must leave immediately. And they would just say bugger off, and that would be the end of it. <laughs> because they had the protection of the Royal Navy. I'm simplifying a complex story. After all, I wrote my PhD about this, my thesis about this, uh, read by 20, 21 people or so. <laughs> but in the 70s, the rules of the game changed. So, let's say we have a British fishing vessel here. They're called a trawler because they have a trawl, a fishing net. And they're, they're there in Icelandic waters. And this is the trawl, the net. And this is the British trawler. And then you haul in the net, full of fish, full of Icelandic fish. <laughs> we do not want that. What can you do? Well, Iceland's contribution to uh, international warfare is the wire cutter. <laughs> you have a trawl, you have a fishing trawler, and you have wires in between. So Icelandic Coast Guard vessels would sail in the wake of the trawler, like this, with the wire cutter, cut the, cut the trawl wires. So down goes the trawl, full of Icelandic fish, and you have a very angry fisher captain here. And this proved the key to our success in the Cod Wars. But along with the development of the law of the sea. So I'm not saying that this was the only reason why we had gained full victory here, but a key factor, this changing, changing rules of the game in the disputed waters. That and the law of the sea. And then there was a third point. Iceland is in the middle of the North Atlantic. To be in the middle of the North Atlantic in the mid 20th century gives you great strategic importance in the thick of the Cold War. Yes, we gained independence in 1944, 
late in the Second World War. Then that war ended. We had uh, occupying forces during the war, first British occupying forces, and then a US presence, military presence, through an agreement with Iceland. And the occupation was friendly. Uh, it is said that the British Icelandic Prime Minister was woken up one evening in, uh, or one night in May 1940. Sir, I can see warships on the bay outside Reykjavik, and there are planes in the sky. And he asked, well, can you see where they're from? They're British, sir. And then he said, well, then I'll fall asleep again, because it was a friendly occupation. It was not the Nazis, which was feared at the time, of course, because Iceland was so strategically important. But anyway, the war comes to an end, but the Cold War begins. And the Americans feel that they have to have and maintain a military presence on this vital stepping stone in the middle of the North Atlantic, in the war between East and West. So in 1951, the American forces return through an agreement with the Icelandic authorities, through a defense agreement that is still in place, but the, uh, the uh, military forces are gone. They left in 2006, unilaterally. The Icelanders weren't too happy about it at the time. They felt they should have been consulted, but there we are. In the latter half of the 20th century, uh, when Icelanders were fighting the British over the fishing grounds, they could use this strategic importance, you see, to their own advantage, to our advantage, to again simplify matters. We picked up the phone, called Washington and said, listen, we are fighting over our vital resource, fisheries around Iceland. If you do not tell the Brits to back down, we're going to shut down that base of yours. We're going to leave NATO. I am simplifying terms. I am exaggerating. But this was the feel. This was the feeling. And the feeling in Washington was, in turn, the message to the British side. Come on. What is more important, a military base up in Iceland or some fish? <laughs> so they put pressure on the British to back down. And that mattered as well. So you see how all these things connect. Uh, access to natural resources, independence, law of the sea. Because we Icelanders must not forget that developments in the law of the sea benefited us. International law benefited us. Agreements, international agreements benefited us. If that had not taken place, everything would have been that much harder. If the might of the strong would have ruled supreme, we would not have secured a favorable outcome. So it was not only the wire cutters, although that is the fun part of the story. <laughs> so here we are. We have gained economic independence. We have gained political independence. What are we going to do about it? This brings me again to maybe Wilhelm Stefansson and nationalism and Arctic affairs. There was a time Let's go back to the mid 20th century or so, when the Icelanders would have underlined in no uncertain terms that we are not Arctic. We have nothing to do with the Arctic. We are European. There are no igloos in Iceland. We built houses of stone and wood. There are no Eskimos in Iceland. We are North European. This was the feel at the time. Of course, things have changed. But this was a strong sentiment at the time. And something that we should readily admit, not to criticize those who went before us, but to understand and maybe do better. Likewise, the US forces on the island, not everyone was welcome in Iceland. No colored persons, please. That was a message from Iceland in the 1950s. And we need to acknowledge that, because if we do not, we will not do better now or in the future. And we learn from the mistakes of the past to make the world a better place now and in the future. And I'm not saying that Icelanders were inherently evil, far from that. But you also have to imagine a small insular nation, a nation that is constantly, like I said, thinking, can we do it? 
And it brings a sense of sort of feeling that we need to hold on to what we have. And that is the challenge that I want to address now as president and as historian and just simply a human being as well. How do we combine the two? A love for your country, a love for your history, a love for your community. And being open, inclusive, tolerant, understanding, accommodating, welcoming, independent, interdependent. That's a tough call. Uh, when I was a historian back in the day, before this happened to me, we Icelandic historians decided, the Association of Icelandic Historians decided to convene a meeting on the end of nationalism, admittedly with a question mark. End of nationalism, question mark, an evening session. Everyone welcome. Hooray. And then the day arrives and we get an email from the board. Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, unfortunately, we have to postpone the uh, planned uh, symposium on the end of nationalism. Uh, Iceland has a vital sporting game tonight and absolutely no one is going to show up. So even in academia, even in the world of historians, there was no end of nationalism uh, there. And I often use this history to also demonstrate the connection between academia and, uh, and the outside world. Uh, we historians, we're no different when it comes to you know, cheering on for your, for your nation at, uh, at the world of sports. So. Uh, it brings me to also the role of historians, yes. When we talk about independence, independence, nationalism, and uh, diversity, tolerance, inclusiveness, and so on, and the roles of uh, heads of state. First, let's begin with the historians. I believe, since I'm here at this great college, Dartmouth College, that it, it must be the duty of us academics historians and others, to reach out, to reach out to the wider public and to do so with full modesty, not arrogance. I believe one of the most challenging tasks of our times is the growing divide between, yeah, between academia and the outside world, between um, well, dare I say, experts and others, or the distrust towards experts. What do the experts know? Why not let common sense rule for once? We have had enough of experts. They do not know everything. We need to tackle this distrust between expertise and the general public. How do we do it? Not by saying, hold on, listen, here, court wars? I'm the expert. I know everything about the court wars. You're not going to argue with me about that. That would be the totally wrong approach. You need to engage. You need to be open. You need to be able to say, listen, all right, we're going to have this discussion. Uh, it just so happens that this is a field on which I know something. So let, let us talk through what we know. And I'm sure, ultimately, you will see my point of view through passion, through uh, persuasion, through uh, the will not to thrust your opinions on somebody else, but to engage. That is the key, I think. And in academia, it is particularly important. So I see myself as an academic who has a duty to the wider public. Now, how about a head of state? Uh, I did mention that Iceland is a country of waterfalls and geysers and volcanoes and what have you. It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful country on earth. <laughs> yeah, this is maybe how I should sound as a head of state. But with that, if you go only in this direction, it will hit you in the end. So uh, 
Furthermore, as a head of state, uh, you need to be, it's almost written in the job description, to be optimistic. You have to be optimistic. Uh, in Iceland, we do not have a State of the Union address. And also, yes, since we're here in the, in the United States, the president of Iceland does not hold the same political powers or political role as does the president of the United States. We have a prime minister back home uh, with her cabinet, and they run uh, the business of government on a day-to-day -day basis. The president is not involved in that. But, uh, so we don't have, like, the president doesn't give a State of the Union address, for instance, but a New Year's address. And can you imagine, if I were to start my New Year's address one day, um, mind you, especially Icelanders in the audience, I'm not going to do it, <laughs> but if I were to start, my fellow Icelanders, Happy New Year. Or should I really say that? Because I don't think there's not going to be anything happy about it. We are a nation with problems ahead of us. We're disunited. We don't agree on anything. Uh, there is uh, so many problems in our society, so many things that go wrong. There is greed, there is uh, uh, selfishness, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's just going to be a gloomy year. Goodbye. <laughs> no, it won't work. But are we going to go totally in a different direction? Iceland is the best country in the world. We Icelanders are better than the rest. <laughs> Everything we do, we do well. And being the most beautiful country on earth, we welcome foreigners to come and see us. <laughs> that is not the message either. Let's try to find a middle ground. I'm not giving any political messages here, but I sometimes think that politics is about compromise. It's not about having your way. Even though you might want to have your way, when you think about it deeply, no compromises and the middle ground might be best for the overall situation. So there again, we need to combine a passion, love for your country, a, an optimism, but also a certain sense of realization, especially during these times when we have so many challenges now, this is an ongoing joke for me. When I started running for president in 2016, I was a complete novice, I, not involved in politics at all, never belonged to any political party. It's not a political uh, post per se, although politicians have been presidents in Iceland or previous politicians. So I wasn't aware of the fact that you're, you're never allowed to talk about problems when you're, in, when, you're, uh, when you're running for something. So they would be aghast, those uh, advisors. You know, Guðni, you said it again. You said the problem word. There are no problems, only challenges. <laughs> yeah, I'm, OK. There are many challenges ahead of us. You, students in the audience, I'm, I'm guessing many of you or some of you are studying something that must have to do something with climate, must have to do something with climate change, must have to do something with energy, must have to do something with how we treat the planet. And we, the slightly older ones, are just counting on you doing better than we did. So there, are, because there are so many challenges there. War in Europe, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, energy crisis. We Icelanders count our blessings with our abundance of uh, green energy, but others are not so fortunate on that continent. So challenges there are, and it would be foolish to be blinded by some empty optimism. But at the same time, unless we have the optimism, unless we have the drive, yes, we can do it, everything will become that much harder. So that's why, for instance, when I meet with students back home who say, like, the world's going to the dogs, and uh, you are not doing anything about it, and we're going on strike, and that's just the only option. And I will say, like, all right, fine, it's go Go on a strike, a climate strike, once in a while. But in between, study, find the solutions. I had the privilege of being the first passenger back home earlier this year on a plane, on an electric plane. That might solve something. That might reduce our CO2 footprint. You always feel a bit guilty when you fly now. There's a solution there. 
another solution. Back home, and in other parts of the world, mind you, you can drill CO2 into the ground. You can capture it, drill it, turn it into stone. That's another aspect where science is helping us. So let's, and I'm coming to the end of my talk here, before, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. That's how we should tackle things. And that's how, it's the same spirit that we felt back home in 1944, when we said, yes, we're gonna show them we can do it. That's the spirit we need. But if that spirit is not connected to realism and an admittance of the mistakes you made, then we truly have challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Gurdney. And uh, I am going to open up the uh, floor to um, two questions for you. And I have two folks who are very kindly going to run a microphone, if you wouldn't mind, for folks on the web, if you wouldn't mind getting the microphone to you as you, as you answer or you give your question to the President. And let me start with any hands up with questions. Oh, we have one right here. Oh, hello, Dr. Snyder. <laughs> Tack för det. Ja, tack så mycket ladies. I have a question about individual transferable quotas and I'm wondering if you with your expertise with your history uh, can tell us a little bit about the lessons that we have learned from Iceland about this um, management instrument. That is true. Thank you very much. We're going to talk more about fish now. Bear with us for a few minutes. Yes, so we won the cod wars. We kicked the foreigners out. We had this fishing resource for ourselves. For a few years afterwards, after 1976, when we uh, got the 200 mile uh, exclusive economic zone, there was the feeling in Iceland that this basically meant that we could catch as much as we wanted. Took us a few years to realize that if this were to continue, the stocks would be depleted. There isn't always enough fish in the sea. It's, it's a lie. So this led to a transition from basically free for all fishing, and again, I'm simplifying matters for clarity's sake, to a quota system. So in the early 1980s, a maximum catch allowance was set, whereby based on the fishing experience of the previous three years, you would get a percentage of the total. Let's say you had caught, I don't know, your fishing company had caught in the last few years uh, annually on average 10,000 tons of caught. Uh, and that would be 15% of the catch that year. You would be able to catch that. You would, that would be your quota. Fair enough. This seemed to be working, but and now I'm entering very sensible territory in Icelandic uh, uh, history, in Icelandic current affairs. The feeling was that for the fisheries to develop, you would have to be able to transfer the quotas from one fishing vessel to another, from one fishing company to another. Somebody might want to stop, somebody might want to expand, so let's be able to transfer the quotas, sell one quota from one fishing boat to another fishing boat, or a fishing company to a fishing company. Fair enough, this seems to be smart. This gives you a flexibility in the industry. However, imagine a small fishing village in the remote part of Western Iceland, the West Fjords of Iceland, a glorious part of Iceland, but the owner of the fishing company there decides that he, it's usually a he, is going to call it quits. Or he has a, such a good offer for his quota that he can't resist it from a big fishing company down south. So he sells the quota. All right, in the name of uh, 
uh, efficiency. This seems the right thing to do, but not if you live in that village. This is, of course, the disadvantage of a transferable quota system. Everybody realizes that, but how to solve it, how to maintain the efficiency of being able to transfer quotas without this potential devastating effect on small communities is a question I do not have the answer for, and unfortunately nobody has the best and clear answer for it. But this is a, an ongoing issue in Icelandic politics and in Icelandic society. Uh, however, and I'll conclude with that, everybody realizes that you have to uh, have a limit, you have to control. Nobody, we cannot go back to the old days where you could just go out and catch. That's gone forever, and everybody realizes that. And furthermore, just to conclude, maybe we're moving to, um, well, we like to think in Iceland that we support sustainable fisheries. Maybe we're moving more and more towards fish farming. But again, that is also a complex issue. Do you want to have complex, do you want to have fish farming on sea with potential problems arising or on land? This is another aspect of Icelandic fisheries with many, many challenges. But I hope I gave you a sort of short description of, of how the system of transferable quotas works, mm. its, its potential advantages and disadvantages. Thank you. And I will say if anyone does want to study these issues in the Arctic, in Iceland and Greenland and Alaska, the Institute of Arctic Studies would love to have you come and work with us. <laughs> <laughs> because they are, they need, they need good minds. Uh, other questions? Oh, one here in yeah, the front? There and there in front and there. Hello. Uh, I'm curious, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that Iceland will face in the next 10 to 20 years, whether politically, economically, socially, or environmentally? Uh -huh. Well, environmentally, <laughs> we're all, all in the same boat. Uh, climate change uh, will affect us all, uh, not only in terms of uh, warming, uh, the warming of the planet, which we see before our eyes in Iceland as the glaciers melt. Now, somebody who would not believe in the theory of global warming would say, well, the glaciers have retreated and advanced, you know, forever, and they will continue to do so. But then our reply must be, yes, but since the Industrial Revolution, we have been polluting, we have been affecting uh, the planet in ways that was not the case and therefore, we are seeing these extremes in development, in uh, changes from hot to cold. And that is one of the challenges facing us. Another challenge uh, directly connected to that is the fact that with uh, uh, ever increasing extremes in weather patterns, you will see uh, more migration. You will see more people fleeing their homes you will see more political instability, you will see more refugees. Iceland has changed tremendously in the last few decades. When I was growing up, there was one kid in my class we felt was very exotic. His mom came from Sweden. <laughs> Otherwise, we were all the same. Icelandic parents, Icelandic names, practically everyone belonged to the state Lutheran church, we all look the same, pale. <laughs> now, around, uh, somebody might have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm now about 20% of the people in Iceland uh, are either foreign born or their parents were born abroad. This has enriched Icelandic society, uh, but uh, increased uh, immigration has created challenges. Uh, I know and feel and I'm confident that we can solve those challenges. We do not have to create those challenges to begin with, but there they are, let's face it. Uh, one related aspect is the future of Icelandic. Uh, 
I want to make sure that we will continue speaking Icelandic, but I do not want the good language of Icelandic to be a barrier in Iceland. So if you do not speak Icelandic, there is a glass ceiling, or there's a, just an obviously clear ceiling. You cannot advance. I'm not saying, you know, if you're a member of parliament, you have to be able to speak Icelandic, and I will always defend that. That's not, you know, discrimination. That's just the fact that we live in a country called Iceland with an Icelandic parliament. But other aspects of society, uh, we are getting used to it now, we in Iceland, that news commentators, weather reporters, can speak with an accent that might sound foreign. And there are some people who feel this is not right. Fortunately, they are in a small minority. And one weather reporter, who actually hails from Germany, I think, has an excellent, strong German accent. He was criticized by somebody. I cannot understand the weather reports when this foreigner is speaking. And he said in perfect Icelandic, and I'll say it first in Icelandic because it rhymes, Þeir skilja sem vilja. In English, those who want to understand will understand. So we just want to solve whatever complex issues may arise through uh, immigration, through the fact that people are not uh, equally as good in Icelandic as, as, as we who have, are born there, and so on and so forth. So climate change and resulting uh, migration in the world, those are aspects that we have to face just like others. But at the same time, Iceland is a small nation, and it has to be said that uh, there is not a strong willingness to, to uh, accept more people fleeing war or poverty than is considered uh, necessary. We know better than others there. Thank you. Um, another question. Oh. Yeah, there was one, one there at the front and then the one, one here front. and there. Yes, please. So. Uh, he was also there in the front. He was. Oh, did I have another one I missed? My apologies. Um, uh, oh, did you not see? So yeah. one here first or no? Uh, yes, yeah, so we go here first. I'm sorry, I didn't see you first, and then we'll go to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I was curious, um, given the the vulnerability of the country to climate change, what your opinions are on the state of international collaboration addressing climate change, and also any thoughts on the current uh, United Nations conference on climate change. Yeah. Well. Uh, Global leaders are convening in Cairo as we speak, and others, uh, uh, CEOs and what have you. Uh, the government of Iceland, led by the prime minister who's there, is determined to uh, uh, aim for carbon neutrality. Now I just can't remember whether it's 2030 or 40 or 50 at the top of my head. <laughs> I should remember it. But the goal is there, and to reduce CO2 emissions. So uh, all I can say is that um, uh, the Icelandic authorities are determined to do what they can. But you will find people in Iceland who will complain that w the goals that the government has set itself are way too uh, modest, that we need to do way much more. And I just cannot. Uh, either comment on it or, or actually uh, uh, safely or state with any conviction whether that is right. We have a coalition in Iceland, three-party coalition, because you have the system of proportional representation, so it's a combination of three parties in the government. One of them is basically left-green alliance, so it's a green party, and the prime minister is a member of that party, so it goes without saying that they have a green emphasis on their policies, but in a coalition you cannot get everything you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I allow myself to be cautiously optimistic. Uh, I allow myself to think that we can find solutions, like the ones I mentioned. Aviation, electricity, not as much pollution, drilling CO2 into the ground, reducing CO2 emissions. So um, 
I'm, so, I'm sorry, I can't give you a more definite answer there, but I, and again, with, with the, with the uh, international deliberations going on in, in Egypt now, uh, I listened with attention to the United Nations Secretary General saying, you know, we're on the edge of the abyss. Uh, still, I like to think there is time to move from that abyss. And again, maybe you, the younger generation, will do something about it that we were not capable of. Thank you. Uh, I saw a young woman in the back there before I go. Uh, the, right uh, in, uh, with your glasses and white. Barbara, right? If you raise. Oh, yes. I, oh, you have it already? Yes, go ahead. I didn't know you already had it. And then the woman in the back. Sorry, um, do you see wire cutters as a good future defense for Iceland? Or <laughs> I also, also like you said, you didn't have much of a navy in the 1940s. Yeah. Is that still true? Kind of what's Iceland's defense situation, I guess? Yeah, that is true. And I mean, with the security climate now, you have to ask yourself, like, how can we defend ourselves? Food security? I should have mentioned that when I talked about challenges of the future. How, if, if worst comes to the worst, how are we set for food? Uh, the wire, like Britain left the European Union a while ago, as you, some of you may know. It led to fierce disputes between British and French fishermen. And then the British side semi-seriously said, you know, we should get those wire cutters from the Icelanders <laughs> to deal with those French, and I will not repeat the word that came after that. Uh, so uh, the wire cutters are there on mu display in museums in Iceland. I don't see a situation where we need to use them in the <laughs> immediate future back home. No, we did not have a navy, but we had a fleet, a coast guard fleet. And it was actually another part of the conflict at sea uh, was the uh, fact that you had, from the Royal Navy, you had frigates, warships, built for... Uh, chasing Soviet submarines, and then if, yeah, uh, in wartime, fire missiles at them, or yeah, torpedo them, or throw bombs at them, or whatever. And they were thin-skinned. Whereas the Icelandic Coast Guard vessels were thick, made of, they were sturdy, and they could move on swiftly, on the spot, they could change directions. So uh, this was handy when you were trying to cut wires and the warships were trying to prevent it if there was a collision well it was deadly serious and you try to avoid it at all costs but the small sturdy coast guard vessel would usually come off better than the frigate which was just sensitive to all this so uh, the that benefited us as well there iceland has a defense agreement as i mentioned from 1951 with the united states so in times of dire emergency, we can call on the US Army to defend us. Iceland is also a member of NATO, a founding member of NATO, where it is stated clearly that an attack on one member is an attack on everyone. This provision led to our friends in Sweden and Finland to apply for membership of NATO, and that is uh, being processed and uh, everybody has reason to expect that Sweden and Finland will soon become members of NATO and for them just like us that is the security umbrella we rely on but let us hope just as we have hoped since the foundation of 19, uh, NATO in 1949 that, that uh, it will not come to the fact that this article will be uh, activated. I have two more questions and that will, will let the things go, but we have one right here. I think you have the mic. Oh, yes. Um, so I just wanted to ask about the geothermal energy that you were talking about. So obviously it's something that is facilitated by like the unique landscape and the demography of Iceland. And however, so that does make it like very difficult to happen elsewhere. So as a country that is very well poised and obviously a leader in the use um, and the development of geothermal um, energy as a form of renewable energy. What do you think um, is Iceland's role in the development of renewable and sustainable sources of energy in the future? Mm -hmm. um, I've just come from a, 
an official visit to Slovakia, a small country in Central Europe. With me were representatives of the Icelandic geothermal industry, representatives of companies, also uh, officials, because you don't necessarily need a hot spot like Iceland to harness geothermal energy. Yes, we have deep, uh, extremely hot resources, as it were. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the technical terms. So we can generate electricity from this extremely powerful source underground. But in many places in Europe and here on this continent, you, can, you only have to drill down a few dozen meters. Do you understand the metrical system here? <laughs> yeah. And then you can find enough hot water to heat homes. And uh, this is being developed here in the States. I will in two days time visit Cornell. And there they are advancing quite fast in this direction, moving. From, and why not here? I, I, I think it can be uh, explored. So our contribution to, to uh, the climate crisis might be to use our expertise. And you know, we're far from inventing how, how to harness geothermal energy. There were others who were doing that before us. But we have certainly developed and uh, increased our knowledge in this field. So this might be another aspect of a positive reason for optimism. OK, let's move from coal. Let's move from oil. Let's move from gas. Let's use geothermal. Let's use solar. Let's use wind. The solutions are there. Yeah, I will say we came from a wonderful visit with President Hanlon where we talked about geothermal energy at Dartmouth. And it was <laughs> really quite pleasant. So last question. Uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be a very mundane question. <laughs> On my, uh, uh, when I was in Iceland, I, there was a certain piece of food that I loved. Uh -huh. And um, I've tried very hard to find it here. Uh, I've ch searched everywhere, and there's an export for this that you could use. And it concerns <laughs> the cod livers packed in tins like sardines. Ah, uh -huh. cod liver oil pills. No, the, oh. the, the real livers. The real livers. The real livers. Mm -hmm. Well, I... And it was, it was delicious. I mean, rather than taking a <laughs> teaspoon of, of cod liver oil, this was much tastier. Astrid, do you know this? I know it, and it is so yummy. It is <laughs> yummy. It is absolutely <laughs> yummy. Good to hear. And you can't get it here. Uh, Bert smoked, smoked cod liver. Bert smoked cod liver, all right. And when I when I got to the airport, I decided I decided I was not going to shop in the in the shop, but get it at the airport. And all the that that area of the of the shelves was empty, so I couldn't bring any home for a year's supply or something. Well, I will have a word with someone. This is. <laughs> Thank you, President Johannesson. My Thank pleasure. you, Thank everyone you all. here. Thank you all for coming.